Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be answering the old mystery of a supernova we observed back in 2006, basically about 15 years ago from when I'm making this video. In this video you're going to discover what we believe happened back in 2006 and why that supernova was one of the most intriguing supernova we've ever observed. Let's talk about this and welcome to the math. So when it comes to the idea of supernova, this is what most people usually imagine. A very large explosion, very bright explosion, when a star explodes and essentially throws out a lot of material, creating these beautiful nebula clouds that you can see from a lot of different locations on the planet. Some of the more popular ones are clouds that look something like this. This is the super famous Crab Nebula created by a supernova just a little bit over a thousand years ago. But the thing is, supernova is just a concept. It's basically a concept of a bright explosion, but their origin can be very different. Some supernova occur when an extremely large and massive star, like for example Rigel right here, explodes because it just can't really support its own weight anymore. And we usually refer to these as type 2 supernova. Many other supernova occur for different reasons, like for example if a white dwarf like this right here, Sirius B, reaches a certain mass and then explodes because it can no longer support itself for very different reasons. We usually refer to this as the so-called Chandrasekhar limit. Now, this is just two examples, but there are so many more when the origin of these explosions can be very different. But then there's another type of a supernova, something we refer to as a superluminous supernova. In other words, something that's even brighter and more powerful than a typical supernova. And these create another mystery, because in many cases it's very difficult for us to actually explain what may have happened to create these really bright flashes that could be as much as 10 times brighter and more powerful. And one of the brightest such events happened in 2006. This was the event known as SN2006GY, and this was, back then, the brightest such flash we've observed. Now since then we've seen much brighter flashes, including the more recent SN2018COW, but in most of these cases these flashes are so bright that sometimes they are actually even brighter than the galaxy they're coming from. In other words, the underlying mechanism for the creation of these unusual flashes must be a little bit different. So this here, the 2006 supernova, happened in the galaxy that you just saw, and until recently we couldn't really explain how exactly so much energy was released at the same time. So this is kind of what we saw originally, and it took about 15 years of observations, and that of course includes observations in the X-ray with Chandra telescope, to finally figure out what may have happened in this particular system in this galaxy known as NGC 1260 at a distance from Earth of over 250 million light years. So our original model involved very very massive stars. Stars that are more massive than about 40 masses of the Sun. So for example the nearby galaxy called Large Magellanic Cloud has one of these stars. It's known as R136A1 which looks something like this if you were to try to compare it to our own sun, and here the mass is over 300 masses of the sun, so obviously one day this will create a very powerful explosion. And the original model suggested that the 2006 supernova was created by a similar star maybe around 150 masses of the sun. Just to give you a comparison, at a distance of about 7000 light years away from us, right there, there is a very massive star known as Eta Carina A it might actually be very similar to the star that we saw explode in 2006. It's about half the mass of the R136A1 star I just showed you, but nevertheless, this star definitely has enough mass to create its own superluminous supernova. And to try to explain the true origins of this explosion, the scientists behind the paper you can find in the description below decided to investigate something we've never really thought of investigating. They've decided to find out how much iron was released during the explosion and essentially how much iron was produced by this very powerful supernova. And they discovered a mass of about one third of the mass of our sun, which is a lot of iron. But more importantly, what this observation suggested to the scientists is that this wasn't just a typical star exploding. This was a star exploding with so much power that the iron inside of the star was actually spread across the galaxy where it originated from. In other words, some other really unusual exotic events must have occurred to trigger such a tremendously powerful expulsion of iron. Now, just the fact that this is a really bright supernova, really powerful supernova, is not enough to explain this amount. Just to give you a comparison in brightness, this is what a typical Type 1a, Type 2, and 2006 GY look like 
in comparison to one another. So as you can see, it is significantly brighter than a typical supernova. But the presence of a huge amount of iron suggests that there was an interaction with something else. And specifically, the scientists believe that there was a pre-existing interaction with an extremely, extremely dense shell of material that was present before the explosion occurred. All right, let me try to help you visualize this. And this is actually a pretty good way for us to start. So the scientists believe that in this system there were actually very likely two stars. Basically it was a binary system. There was a very massive giant, probably not as big as R136, but possibly still a lot more massive than a typical star. So here we could have a star that's about 100 or so masses of the sun. And then there was an object very similar to our sun that eventually turned into a white dwarf. Now, we don't really know where it originally came from, it could have even been just captured from somewhere, because usually white dwarfs come from stars that live a little bit longer than these really massive stars, but this white dwarf was essentially orbiting around the larger star, as the larger star started to expand and get bigger and bigger and bigger as it grew older and older, and at some point its shell very likely started to actually touch the white dwarf itself, which obviously meant that the white dwarf started to absorb a lot of this matter and accreted it around itself, creating a very interesting system. But this is really not the important part here. The important part is that now the white dwarf was essentially inside of the star itself. And we can try to simulate this by essentially creating what the inside of the star might have looked like. So here we have the outer shell, this is all of the envelope and all of the material that's slowly expanding. And inside we have the so-called core, this is the very dense, very powerful core of this very massive star. But now we also have this white dwarf that's inside the shell itself and we're going to try to see what happens here because it's going to slowly start moving closer and closer to the core. And this is happening because as the white dwarf orbits inside the star, a lot of the material here is slowly slowing it down, dropping its orbit, making it approach closer and closer to the core. Now at some point, it's obviously going to move so close to the core that it's going to be practically touching it. And here we can try to see if this initiates what we want this to initiate. Because we are expecting for this to actually start a type 1 supernova, because the white dwarf is about to reach its limit where it sort of explodes and can no longer maintain its own shape. And remember, all of this is happening inside of the actual massive star. So basically, all of this is currently occurring inside of this giant. We don't really know what a white dwarf inside of a typical massive star would even do to the star, maybe it actually disturbs it completely, but nevertheless, we think that this is exactly what happened. And we've even observed similar events in other systems as well. But anyway, here, as the white dwarf approaches the core, at some point, it initiates a type 1a supernova that suddenly explodes with so much power that it also throws away the entire shell of the star as well, and all of this creates a tremendously bright and very powerful explosion, much more powerful than a typical type 1a supernova. And this is also why suddenly we see all of this iron being thrown out of the star itself. And this whole process, from the white dwarf being on the outskirts of the star, to the stage where it finally reaches the center, probably took less than a century. So basically, um, a few decades, maybe 100 years or so. Now obviously, if the white dwarf did not collide with the core, it would still produce an explosion, it just, we don't think it would be as powerful as what we witnessed. We think it could have been a typical supernova, what's known as a type 2 supernova, and maybe the white dwarf would actually get thrown out of the system, but instead this initiated what became the brightest explosion until, I guess, a few years later when we saw another one. And in a nutshell, this tells us that supernova are just very diverse, very sort of unpredictable event. Sometimes it results in an explosion of one star, sometimes it results in a collision of two stars that create these types of explosions, and sometimes it might be actually initiated by something completely different. And one of the main reasons it's important for us to understand these events is because here on the planet Earth we've also discovered emissions from supernova of the past that bombarded our planet with a lot of various particles including iron. And we don't really know what it causes to our planet, but it's important for us to understand if it can actually cause some sort of an extinction event. But other than that, after 15 years, that's kind of all we know about this spectacular event witnessed in 2006. It's very likely we're going to see a lot more of these various super uh, luminous supernova happening in the next few years, because they don't seem to be as rare as we initially thought. Although explaining their origin and also trying to predict them is a completely different story. We're just not able to do so just yet. 
But anyway, on that note, thank you so much for watching, hopefully you enjoyed this video, and if you did, don't forget to subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before, and maybe support this channel on Patreon, because it does help me quite a lot. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.